we're thrilled today to have this group here to give their talk on um, assimilated case studies for clinical education. Before I tell you who they are, I want to tell you why we selected them. Um, one of the goals of the Provost Colloquium series is to highlight not just kind of the kind of lab scholarship that you expect to take place in the sciences or maybe the art endeavors that you would find in theater or art, but also to take a look at advanced <coughs> pedagogical practices, cutting edge teaching research that is helping make ESU, even though we're affordable, a fabulous place for students to come and learn. Right? And that's why they were selected, because this isn't just, oh, let's just give something a try. They very, very systematically are studying this particular pedagogical practice, this particular way to help make sure that students are best prepared to get out there and, and serve the people that they'll be serving in the future. And so I'm very happy to introduce to you today uh, Professor Robert Ackerman, uh, Associate Professor Luann Batson Magnuson. I'm sorry, I missed that. Magnuson. Mag Magnuson. Mag 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 Magnuson. There we go, sorry. And Professor Elaine Chewy and Assistant Professor uh, Rachel Wolf. They are all from the Department of Communication Science and Disorders, and they're going to talk to you about how they are using simulated cases to help prepare their graduate students to go out and, and work with people in um, commu the communication sciences and disorders. So I, I welcome you all, and I thank you all. You're in for a fabulous presentation. So we're going to start a little bit from the beginning, because even for us, this is a brand new process. Um, what we typically do in the field of speech and language pathology is we're responsible for making sure that our children, our students, learn not only um, the actual knowledge necessary in speech language pathology, but they learn specific clinical skills. And they're able to work with a client from the initial referral to the book, through the evaluation to the diagnosis and then into the treatment phase of, of the project. Um, so simulated cases are something new to us. Um, one of our goals as clinical educators is to ensure that our students are provided with experiences with a broad variety of clients. It's essential. In the field of speech-language pathology, we work with children. We work with children with developmental disorders. We work with children who have syndromes. We work with adults who've had strokes. We work with adults who have dementia. So we work with a broad age range, and we work with a variety of individuals that have various um, medical issues that cause communication disorders. So part of our responsibility to our students is to ensure that they get a broad span of clientele that they have experience with. That being said, we have a speech and hearing clinic on campus, um, and our students see um, clients on campus from birth to into their 90s, we tend to have. Um, so they see a broad range of clients, but they don't always see what we would consider to be low incidence disorders. So um, individuals that have more rare clinical <coughs> diagnosis, um, they don't gain that experience with them. Not every student might have the opportunity on campus to work with a client who has aphasia, which is a loss of language, loss of the ability to use language to communicate. So we need to provide those opportunities to those students if they haven't had the opportunity to have an actual client. One of the ways we're trying to do that is to use simulated cases. Um, our students are responsible for getting 400 hours of clinical experience um, by the time they complete the master's degree program. And sometimes we need an additional way to add hours for them to be able to access hours. So we're using these simulated cases both in our classes um, and using them as part of our instruction within the class setting. And we, our plan is to, and we have used some of the cases to remediate students, students that are struggling with working with particular types of disorders and, and identifying appropriate assessment strategies and treatment strategies using the, the, uh, clinic, the simulated clients. Um, and then we're also hoping to use it and expand it as the cases expand as well to be able to use it so that they can work with clients they may not have had an opportunity to work with. Um, say a head and neck cancer patient who's had their mandible removed because of surgery. Not every student's going to get an opportunity to work with a client with a mandibulectomy. 
So some of these cases will provide them with that opportunity. So we're looking for a variety of clients and we're looking for sufficient hours for our students to have. Some of the dilemmas that we have with direct contact hours is that as they go out into externships and they do two externships, a school placement and a medical placement, uh, we're finding it harder to uh, find locations and facilities that are willing to take our students on and give them a broad range of clientele to work with. A lot of that is coming from um, litigation and lawsuits, um, not against students per se, but the fear of that um, and the liability risk in these facilities. So they're less likely to take <coughs> students. Additionally, there have been um, a large number um, and an increasing number of programs in speech language pathology that are um, <coughs> beginning master's programs. So now all of those programs are fighting for the same facility placements. Um, and it's getting very competitive in those environments. Um, some of the places that they go, some of the students go to um, nursing home settings. And so they tend to see primarily in the nursing home settings are clients with dementia. Um, if they go to a rehab setting, they're more likely to see clients with aphasia or traumatic brain injury. So based on what clinical setting they get, it varies the types of clients they get experience with. And again, the simulated cases are something that we're hoping to use to close the gap. So every student gets very similar experiences and experiences with the clients. Um, we've had changes in healthcare. Um, insurance changes that are restricting the amount of hours and time that clients can get services. So we're seeing less activity in the healthcare system with clients um, receiving therapeutic services. They might get an evaluation, they may only be able to afford through their insurance company a couple weeks of therapy. Um, our clinic here on campus allows us to take the community members in our community and bring them into our clinic and provide them services beyond what the insurance um, uh, can cover. So we're able to keep them in therapy for a longer period of time and, and make services, um, give them services, which is helpful. But there are changes that are occurring in healthcare. And I know you're probably all up on, on or following some of the news with changes with Obamacare versus whatever new plan will be put into place. That will have a direct impact on our ability to provide clinical experiences for our, for our students. Um, Affiliation agreements are legal documents, they're contracts with companies um, that have to be made before a student can go out to a particular site. We have affiliation agreements for our students at more, over 100 sites, um, but these affiliation agreements are getting harder to come by. Um, they're getting more um, limited and uh, the demands of the legal aspect of it are getting higher and more complicated. Dr. Wolf deals with all of those issues on a regular basis as our externship coordinator. So we need simulations to supplement for our live and uh, real client experiences in order to meet the breadth of what we're supposed to cover and the skills we're supposed to teach. So what is a simulation? It's a very broad term, actually. Um, and the broad term allows for the use of mannequins. And we'll talk about some other ones. The use of physical models. It allows for um, standardized patients. And, and standardized patients are the type of patient that is they're actually an actor or an actress, someone who's trained to come in and pretend to be that patient. So they know the types of errors to make, they know the way to produce their speech, um, but they're trained to act like particular types of disorders. So that's something that is permitted. Um, or now, and many of you probably are from uh, a generation that has played computer games um, and simulations and those types of things and use avatars. Anybody go into any of the uh, reality-based avatar programs. Um, so we are broadening the definition of what simulations are with our ex extension of computer use. The American speech, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to go. The American Speech Language and Hearing Association requires 400 contact hours. Just in 2016 was the big change that occurred that is allowing us actually to do simulations. But in 2016, they made an, a, a an addendum to their requirements for services and for the hours and how those hours could be achieved. And they expanded to say that they could be alternative clinical education hours. They're only permitting 20% of those hours to be um, utilized or found in a simulated situation. That's a total of 75 out of the 400 hours that um, ASHA permits. 
Um, they defined ACE as being standardized patients, virtual patients, which is what we're going to show you today. Our simulations are virtual patients. So these are patients that are in computerized programs. Um, digitized mannequins. So uh, for example, if I wanted to train my students to put a, a tracheotomy tube in or take a tracheotomy tube out, uh, we can use mannequins um, and allow them to permit practice on that. Nursing does that a lot. They're, they use mannequins to teach blood pressure. They use mannequins and simulations to teach blood draws. Um, so it's very common in medical um, situations to have these types of uh, virtual patients and standardized patients. Um, there is immersive reality. We aren't looking at immersive reality. Um, immersive reality is, is, is to use the 3D virtual reality and to enter a virtual world and communicate with a patient in that environment where the clinical instructor has the capability to have that patient respond in any way they want. Um, so for interviewing a patient to get a background history, um, the person who is running the uh, sim is allowed to provide various information and change the information that's provided to the student. Um, task trainers are the ones I talked about where um, we would be looking at doing blood pressure, removing tracheotomy tubes, and replacing tracheotomy tubes, um, all of those types of things. Um, but we're going to talk about more um, the computer-based interactive model. So when we break down simulations, in general we have our low fidelity um, simulations. They're not computerized. That involves the task trainers. That involves case studies. So if in a class a professor presents a case study, the students have to decide from that case study a hypothesis about what might be wrong with the client, decide what tests or uh, assessments need to be conducted, and then they're given the follow-up information on what the test results were, and then they have to come to a diagnostic conclusion. That's considered a low fidelity simulation. Mid-fidelity simulations are simulations with computerized patients or video games. You'll see that ours somewhat simulates a, a video game and the standardized patients. High fidelity are computerized human patient mannequins. Um, extremely expensive. Um, not fully researched yet for us in the area of communication disorders um, and also those immersive virtual reality types of environments. Um, so low fidelity are cost-effective. Um, there's something that have been used um, probably as long as we've had the communication sciences and disorders program here 50 years ago. Um, but mid-fidelity is where we're at right now um, and a lot of the types of programs that we're bringing into the mid-fidelity um, are mid-fidelity types of activities. Um, a good simulation needs to be tied directly to curriculum goals, to skills that a student needs to do. Um, they need to be realistic in interaction so that the student gets real world experience, knows what it's like if a client refuses to answer a question or if they're not sure what you said and they didn't understand your question so that you can modify and, and revise your questions. Um, they all need to be focused on learning by doing. So not just learning by lecture, but in these, in these sims, the, clients, the students have to do things. Um, one thing that we really like about the simulations is that they provide opportunities without risk. You're not at risk of harming someone else in a simulation environment, right? Um, and that's something that I know Dr. Wolf will talk about was very important to our students. Being able to make a mistake and not being worried that you're going to actually harm someone, make the wrong diagnosis and not allow the client to get the services that they need, um, choose the wrong therapy technique so the client's progress is limited. Um, they are very conscientious and that makes them very anxious when you're working with live individuals that they might make a mistake. So the simulations offer an environment that's safer. If they can make a mistake, do it again, try it again, um, and Dr. Ackerman will um, certainly explain that. So as I said, case studies are something that you can do. Role playing, we have oftentimes in the clinic, we will have undergraduate students or we'll have volunteers who come um, and they will come in to be a, a client to have a swallow assessment conducted. Or right now we're running a research project, project on lupus and um, rheumatoid arthritis and looking at cognitive deficits that individuals have. So undergraduate students have been coming and practicing the testing um, with our graduate students so that the first person they see is not one of the subjects in the study. So they get very strong skills in, in giving that particular one. 
standardized patients. We haven't actually used any standardized patients who have the acting skills to um, portray various communication disorders um, in our program, but other programs do use them. And then, of course, our computerized virtual patients, which is SimuCase. And SimuCase is what we utilize with our students and what we're taking a look at, the effectiveness of it. Uh, what positive impacts does it have? What potential issues does it raise for us? Um, do they feel that they're gaining um, enough experience with that particular type of client um, to feel more comfortable seeing live clients with those types of disorders? So we're, we're having them work on them before they see clients in those situations. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ackerman, who's going to actually show you our simulation that we've been using, or a couple, you're just showing me one language simulation that we're using. We use the simulations for um, our speech clients, clients that have language deficits. Um, there are simula simulations even for clients who have swallowing problems. So the students are using those as well. Do you want this too? Or? No. Okay. Okay. I got the, the good one. I get to play. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean simulated cases? Well, we'll g I'm going to take you through not a whole one because it would actually take one or two hours to really do it. Um, but we're just going to kind of play around. What do we mean, simulated cases? We use this uh, that we see up here. The, the company that has made these is called speechpathology.com. Uh, they are, uh, have been around for many years. They do excellent, excellent uh, continuing education programs. And we often encourage our students and we ourselves use them for continuing education. They, a couple years ago, they came out with this series. And I think there are about, I just counted this morning, about 25 of these cases up. Uh, our students, we have asked to buy a subscription. And the subscription is a low, low, it sounds like a pitch on television, call now, but a low, low $69. For $69, they get 12 months of access, total access to all the cases. So that's 25 cases. So it's an excellent, excellent bargain, in my, in my opinion. Let's get started. Let's see. I've got a stand over here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. First of all, uh, we're going to do this case called Carly. And a nice feature of it is that you've got this clipboard along the right. So the clipboard is basically going to be a transcript of everything that you've done and every decision that you've made. And it's also going to show you, in a kind of a not-so-subtle way, the mistakes that you're making. So the clipboard is really nice. And sometimes information comes into you via the clipboard. So we'll keep that clipboard open right there. OK? So the components of the uh, case are going to be case history. I'm just going to kind of go back and forth. Case history, we have collaborators, which is people that you're going to consult and get information about the client. We have a hypothesis, which I'll explain. Actual assessments that you get an opportunity to conduct. Uh, a diagnostic statement and then recommendations. This kind of mirrors the type of process that we go through when we're doing assessments with real patients. Okay, let's get started. So this is Carly. Hi, I'm Sydney. I am Carly's mom. This is the mom. I am happy to answer any other questions that you have. Okay, now we get to decide what kinds of questions do we want to ask. So I'm going to go right to areas of concern. Not following my own notes. Areas of concern. Okay, so I'm just going to pick through some of these. And if I ask a, a question that I shouldn't be asking, the system will actually give me a little prompt, and it'll say, oh, maybe you want to reconsider that question. That's not so appropriate right now. So that's just a little ding that you get. Sometimes they're subtle on the clipboard. What are your concerns? I am worried that her speech and language skills may be delayed for her age. Four weeks ago, Carly started to stutter, and I didn't know what to do. She would be trying to tell me something and just couldn't get the words out. At first I thought it was cute, but then I got very worried and requested this evaluation. She only stuttered for a few days and then it went away. I just want to make sure she is okay. So have a look at this question that I have highlighted here. If you were listening carefully, you might conclude, this is not a good question because didn't she just say about four weeks ago? So if I clicked on this question, I could ask it and the mom would answer it, but I'm going to lose points for that question. It's not efficient. It's already been asked and answered, essentially. So I'm not going to click that. Um, 
Uh, here's one. Do you think the speech issues are your husband's fault? If I click that one, she might answer. Well, let's see what she says. No. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, I'm losing points for that question because it was probably not an appropriate question. Um, all right. We go through, and for example, I can ask a generic open ended. She how was tested when she began preschool. Her hearing was fine. Okay, so there's some information. Mm, I'm going to skip around. We've got all these categories that we can look at. I'm going to, uh, this first one seems like a nice open ended generic question, so here we go. Carly has been very healthy and she has never had to have any extra services. Uh, so hearing that, we're not going to now ask, does she go to OT? Does she go to PT? Does she do this and that? She, the mother has just told us that she gets no extra services. So if I ask those questions, again, I'm going to be docked points. We're looking for efficiency uh, and effectiveness, I guess. Right? <laughs> like, here's the question that I'm highlighting. Has she ever been seen by a specialist? Well, no, she just told us. She doesn't get any services. Okay. Does she snore? Let's just see if she does. No. All right. <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, I am interested in speech uh, fluency and voice, so I'm going to kind of zero in on those kinds of questions. Um, let's see. Here's one. Does Carly have any active phonological processes? Well, that's a technical question. It involves jargon, and I'm probably going to be penalized if I ask that question. Sorry, I do not know the answer to your question. So uh, that was kind of a waste, right? <clears throat> We can keep going. Um, here's another one. What is Carly's MLU? Professional jargon. She's not going to be likely to answer that question yet either. Sorry, I do not know the answer to your question. So we go through, I don't have a lot of time, but you can kind of see you get to select things. There are a whole range of possible case history questions you could ask. Only some of them are appropriate. As you ask good questions, your points build up. And as you ask inappropriate questions, you get docked. Um, okay, let's go over to collaborators, which is kind of fun. Now, I'm going, I already heard from the mother, so let's hear from the father. Hi, I'm Carly's dad. We have been sharing custody since our mother and I separated. I had Carly last weekend and I'm willing to answer any questions. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to pass this one by, but you see the kinds of questions that you might ask the father. And the father might be a good informant, you know, for example, you might want to know if he's noticed the same things or another context as the mother. So those are some kinds of things that you might do. Okay, we close him. Um, I believe mom said she goes to preschool, didn't she? So there is a Hello, teacher. Hello, this is Ms. Emily Jenkins. Carly is a student in my preschool class this year. When Carly started preschool, she was quite shy. However, she has become very familiar with our class routine and is much more interactive now. Her mother was very concerned when she started stuttering earlier this month. However, I haven't noted any stuttering in the past few weeks. I recently completed a student checklist for Carly and will email it to you now. A nurse practitioner visited my classroom earlier this year and screened all of the students' hearing. I will do my best to answer any additional questions. So the teacher has now emailed us something. So let's see what it is. I'm going over onto the, check, to the uh, clipboard. And here's stuff the teacher said, look at this. And this is one of my favorite features of the, the program, is that you get supplemental materials. So let's see if this will open. Oh, look, the teacher has sent us this. And it's filled out on Carly. Pretty neat. Here's the dates. These things, you could study these and see what we have. Um, it looks like Carly's in good shape along these lines, right? Here's a little narrative from the teacher. So that's a nice feature. So uh, uh, periodically, things appear on the clipboard that are useful to you. Okay. So and in the interest of time, I'm going to go now to hypothesis. And really, you all don't have enough to make a hypothesis because we didn't ask all the questions and get all the information. But this section is a very important one. It's actually not graded by the system, which I didn't realize the first time I went through it. Um, but you type something in here, and it's basically your assessment plan. 
So based on what we've gotten so far about Carly, because we haven't seen her yet, uh, we will develop kind of like an assessment plan. What are we looking out for? Well, the mother indicated that there were some non-fluencies or stuttering behavior. Teacher also said the same thing, but they've gone away. So we don't know what's going on, but we're going to be kind of alerted to possibility of fluency disorder, but maybe not. We don't know. Okay? So you have to type something in here. So let's just type um, maybe a typical development, and then I'm going to want to probably look at specifically fluency. Okay? It's hard to type with people watching. So anyway, so yeah, so there is my hypothesis an assessment plan. Now the assessments is kind of the meat of this one. Look at all the possible areas that we can assess. We're not going to do all these. In fact, th today I'm only going to select a couple of them. So let's look at articulation and phonology. Um, what did I want to open? There is a, hold on, standardized test that we often administer for articulation. I'm going to click administer. I'm not actually going to administer it in this simulation because that's something that we haven't gotten to yet. The students have learned how to administer this test elsewhere in clinic, but what I'm just going to get is the results. So this is a thing that's missing. I don't get to actually administer the test on here. I will get my results down somewhere here. If it'll open. Okay. So here's my results down here in the right corner. Standard score of this, percentile of this, confidence interval. She sat quietly, no sound errors noted. So that's a little summary of the test result. Okay, so I can do that. Uh, what else do I like? I like expressive language because I want you to see, actually see our kid here. So let's go, where does it need to be? I think it needs to be here. Ah, okay. We finally get to see our kid. So it goes on and on. Um, you want to call your dad? Let's call your dad. Hannah? Uh, what are you doing? Okay, so it goes on like this, and this is about a four-minute clip, and this is an important part of this uh, case because we're actually seeing the client, and we're seeing an example of her behavior, and we're always telling our students you need to observe the client in some kind of a naturalistic uh, environment, and so that's what we're doing. And our student is listening to this. Our student is listening for speech sound errors, maybe. Maybe listening for certain expressive language um, structures, maybe looking at play behavior, listening to the sound of her voice, listening for non-fluencies, all of these listenings we're doing in this little four-minute clip. In a real assessment, we would have much more than a four-minute clip, but this is what we have in this particular one. Um, we have materials, for example, we can open up this little guy, which I know is too small for you to see, but this is a protocol or a score sheet that we might use when listening to the sample and filling this out. So that's a nice feature. Got a lot of those in these simulations. Um, okay, so that's one. I also wanted to look at social-emotional. Um, again, this play observation is going to be the same sample that we just watched, but now uh, we get to see and fill it out in a slightly different way. So here's a checklist that we could use and uh, basically score what we're seeing based on that. So that's kind of nice. What else did I wanted to look at? I wanted to look at fluency. 
So that was one of the things that the mother highlighted and the teacher highlighted as any abnormality whatsoever. So what are we going to do? Um, I think I wanted to look at this. And again, it's going to be the same sample that we just did, so I won't play that. But what can we do? Well, we've got this kind of a form, and uh, it's pretty generic. One thing I might mention about these forms and checklists is that the professor is always free to substitute something else. You know, if the professor says, you know, no, don't use that one that they've got on the case. Use this other one that we like better over here because we went over that one in class. The student can then do that. So there's flexibility that you don't have to do this. But these are kind of nice things. Um, also, since I see it here, uh, these are case studies that have been extensively uh, thought about and created. And here's the references in case anybody wonders what's the research basis of this. Here's the reference list. So that's kind of nice. What else? Uh, can't ignore the hearing. So of course, we're going to do a pure tone. Now our students have learned how to do a pure tone test elsewhere. We're obviously not going to do it in the, in the case. So we administer it, and then we have results. So here's a nice looking audiogram for pure tone. You guys who know what this is. Uh, let's also do, can't let this go. We've got to do attempts. So let's administer that. Our students also do this. Nice normal looking tympanograms, which our students should recognize. Okay, what else? I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Let's go to the oral exam. Well, we're not going to do the adult one. We're going to get docked points if we click on that. <laughs> Our kid's three. Just smile for me. Uh, let me see. Open your mouth really big. Oh, my goodness. Can you stick your tongue out? Move your tongue side to side. Let's see you put your tongue on the top of your mouth like this. Good girl. Can you put your tongue behind your teeth? <coughs> there you go. You got it. Let's see you give me a kiss. Good work. What's that? Ooh, ee. Ooh, ee. Good job. What about ee, I, ee, I, yo? Well, anyway, it goes on, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But um, another, another advantage of this kind of a clip is that you get to see a professional clinician uh, administering this kind of a thing. So you can kind of picture yourself doing this. In the interest of time going on, uh, now, we need to select the diagnostic statement. So there are all these possibilities, and just to cut through the red tape, I am going to uh, let you in on the secret that it turns out that there are no areas of concern for this kid. She's typically developing. So I'm going to <coughs> click that, select it, and look how my diagnosis turned green. I'm good. Correct. <laughs> Got it. Um, recommendations, a very important part of the process. So now what? Well, have a look at those recommendations. What are, the, what are you going to click? Who wants to venture a guess? Which one is correct, correct of the choices here? Kind of told you that she is a typically developing child. Yes? I does not qualify for outpatient services. She doesn't. That's true. Read on. Read on. There's more on this piece. Um. Yeah. <laughs> correct. She doesn't qualify. But here's what we usually do. She's a three-year-old. And we're going to say, you know what, um, she's good for now, and we do a little education with the parent. But you know, if you have any concerns, please come back. And that's an important piece to say. So that's the one I'm going to select. Good. Green light. All right. Save. No, no, I'm going to submit the case because my time is running out. This is uh, another screen that I like. Now look how we did. We didn't do that well because we didn't actually do the whole case. However, this gives the student an idea of not only their total percentage, which in this case is 42%, not that hot, but yeah, I also get to see where my weaknesses were. What did I mess up on taking the case history? Did I not ask the collaborators the right kinds of questions? 
What did I do? Did I not administer the right assessments? So what I can do, and this is what Dr. Magnuson was referring to, no harm, no fall. We haven't hurt anybody. What can we do? Start over. Start over, and, and this is a nice thing that we can do. Um, is just do it over, over and over until I get up to the percentage that I need. Okay? So that's kind of a quick one run through of what it looks like. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Uh, Dr. Shui. Okay. There's your slides. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we were first allowed to use this last fall, and I teach voice disorders. And a voice disorder is something that's occurring usually right around here, There's something wrong in your larynx. Either you've got vocal nodules, or maybe you were in a car accident and your vocal fold is paralyzed, something like that. So I chose one of the voice uh, cases to do, and you've already seen the areas that are covered in it. And it was a little boy named Colt. He had a functional voice disorder. This was most students' first attempt at simucase. And it was also my first attempt at grading it. So I set it up because I tried it myself and I made lots of mistakes on purpose. And I thought achieving 90% might be kind of tough. So I decided if you hit 90%, you got full credit. And then I had it down from there. Like if you got 85%, you got so many points. Well, the whole class got 90%. Because really, you need to grade the subsections. But you learn. That's OK. Um, so the students did it, as, as you saw, they could keep redoing it until they turned it in. Things they told me, they, they liked making mistakes without a real client seeing them or without a faculty member seeing them make mistakes. Uh, they liked the feedback. You saw some of the feedback on there. Um, they didn't like the case history, and they felt that it was inappropriate. And I'll show you the scores. That was where they scored the lowest. They just didn't think they learned enough from the case history to do it well. Um, so what I did then is I went over case histories live in class. We did a practice one, and um, they were happy with it. They did very well. Now, I only on my syllabus put down this one case because I thought it took a lot of time. And most students told me it took them between two and four hours to do the first one. Um, but they said, oh, we could do another one. I said, well, but it's not built on my syllabus. And they said, well, extra credit. So I had them do a second one. So you're going to get to see. Uh, the differences. So the second one was a very different case. It was an organic case. It was somebody who has um, an unusual disorder and she had something thrown in. There was a neck injury that had nothing to do with anything, but you had to realize that. So these are my scores. Colt, the first one they tried, they did much worse on case history than when they did the second one with Amy. But in between here, we had done practice on how to do a case history. Collaborators wasn't bad to begin with, but got better. Hypothesis was fine because you know, everybody gets 100. The assessments got better. Uh, the diagnosis already was quite high, and the recommendations got better. And I have it laid out this way, too, so you can see this blue is cold. This was case history. Um, really, a lot of scattered scores and not all that good. When we got to Amy, after more practice, they did very well. Same thing with collaborators. Colt was all over the place here. Amy, it was mostly 100%. They knew who to pick to work with. And assessments got better, although I still think we need a little work. And diagnosis was better. OK? Um, I'll just go back to that for a moment. I think I'm going to use this again. I have no question I'm going to use it again. The students loved it. I loved it. It saved me an enormous amount of time, because normally to meet this outcome that we have, where we, we have a set of outcomes that are given to us by our accreditation agency. I would do a practice fake um, case in class. I was the client. I had a case history laid out. They would ask me questions. I gave them test results. Uh, they had to come to the conclusions just like this. But then I had to read 30 different copies of the same evaluation report, because they all wrote up an evaluation report. That would take me probably 10 hours to get done. I just got to look at their results. Now, I had to go back and do more case history. So I really like doing this because they get the skills without me spending all that time reading all this stuff. And they really were kind of all the same because it was the same information. But I know that next year I need to do more training on case history before they do the first one. 
And I do need to have them practice some writing on this. So I think what I'm going to have them do is write up the case history because they do need that skill and that was missing this year. And they all felt I should put both of the studies into my syllabus at, for credit. So I think I'm going to do that because it's just more practice on voice and it's not that somebody in another class would use these two because nobody else does voice cases. Okay, so I felt it was extremely successful. I think the students did too. They loved it. I love being center of attention. Well, um, where is, okay, so I teach diagnostics actually at the graduate program and I think it is one of the hardest things that you have to be able to do as a clinician um, because it takes research skills and it takes your ability to not be able to just memorize things. You have to be able to have critical thinking skills. You have to be able to be an investigator, be a detective. And when I see the different areas of an evaluation, it kind of looks like a research study to me. So when you're getting your case history, it's like you're doing your literature review. It's like getting a little bit of a background. And then you come up with your, and that's your collaboration. Then you come up with your hypothesis of what you think the problem is. And then you come up with your methods, which is your assessment. And then you come up with your results from your test, and you come up with some conclusions after you analyze it. But it takes a lot of skills that you just have, there's no right, it's not, there's not a right answer that you can read or learn in a book. And it's harder to teach, because you have to have decision-making skills and problem-solving skills. And I think that programs like SimuCase and simulated studies take away from the idea that I can just lecture and teach you and you just accept what I'm going to give you. What I'm doing is I am creating scenarios that you're going to learn through by your own, using your own knowledge and that which I'm providing you. So I'm guiding you. And that's why I think there's effective use of simulation for clinical studies because it encourages guided instruction. It encourages that flipped classroom where I am not just giving you a lecture. I'm um, asking you to come up with your own conclusions, too. Um, you will gain information from actually using what you're learning uh, through doing it, through thinking about it, through your own making sense and your own critiquing. So you're not just saying, oh, I accept what my professor gives to me. I am going to critique what's out there and make some decisions for myself. So it pro promotes that problem-based learning, and that's what problem-based learning is, is you working through it with someone facilitating that for you. Um, and it makes you have a more prominent role in your own education. So you're not relying on your professor, you're actually experience it. And what I feel is that that's the best way to learn. You're not just, I'm, get, I'm not just teaching you the knowledge bases and then asking you to use them, I'm asking you to use them right now while we're learning them. So that's a really important. It's a, and also it has that evidence base to it. So like Dr. Shuey said, I don't have to read everything and say subjectively what I, my opinion is. They're all the same. They're all being graded in the same way when you're doing the SIMU case. Everybody has the same um, chance of getting it right or wrong and I have the same expectations. The computer does, not me as your professor. Um, so I like that about it. It has the idea of instructional alignment, um, that what I'm teaching is also what I'm assessing and what my expectations are and how I teach it are all lined up together. Um, it has the uh, feedback section. It provides feedback and it also allows me to provide feedback to my students. So I'm working along with them. That's what that debriefing is. I get to lead discussion and teach self-analysis and kind of get you to reflect on what you're doing. Um, so I can then help work through it with you as opposed to looking at it after the fact. So teaching during debriefing and teaching analyzing skills and te teaching your own self-monitoring of your performance is really an um, important part of this program too that it has a debriefing component where I can actually see along the way how you're doing. And I can kind of facilitate your own self-improvement instead of me telling you 
the right way to do it. And maybe it, then uh, you won't be able to do it on your own. But if you've figured it out for yourself and I've just guided you to coming to those conclusions, you're more likely to have an awareness and understand why those changes need to be made. Um, so what I was really interested in for my section was to kind of look at what the students who purchased this SIMU case for the, this membership, what they thought about the program. Um, so I created a, we created a Likert scale to rate the different, um, and gave it to the first year students, there are 30 of them, and what their experience has been. And I broke it down into different types of questions, ones that were more specific to the learning experience, and then ones that were more specific to the program. So I put in questions about um, how they thought it benefited their educational program and improved their clinical skills, and then more specific to those different sections that we presented. Do you think this section was useful versus another? So we could get an idea for our own um, instruction to what the students thought about the program. And the five was the, str felt they felt strongly agreed that it was useful um, versus one, which was that they strongly disagreed. And you can see from the scores, this is an average of the scores for the different areas. I grouped in red the ones that were um, more generalized versus le more specific. And there really were very high um, ratings based on their opinion of the the program. They felt that it was strong, they strongly agreed that it was valuable to their learning experience, that it was relevant to their educational program, to um, enhancing their clinical skills now that they're, especially since now, when I gave them this scale, they're out there actually working with clients. So they're actually doing some of these things and um, and they, they had done some diagnostics in the class with real um, clients, but they uh, felt like it was very uh, helpful to their skin clinical skills. Then they went through each of the different areas, and I kind of analyzed why they felt that some of the domains were more or less relevant to them. I think that the hypothesis was lower, mostly because it was the one area that they could go back and change, and it wasn't rated. Um, because when you make a hypothesis, it's an estim uh, educated guess. So I don't think they give you as much of a score on that because that's the nature of a hypothesis, um, is that it can be changed as things go along. So they didn't feel that that was as help, as useful. But overall, there still was very high ratings for the different areas um, across all the domains that the program looks at. Um, and they were overall very happy with the program. And every one of the 30 students that I asked to, to do this uh, scale did, participated in it. And that also shows that they wanted to support the program because um, it wasn't required that they do that. Um, and I just put in a, a table that shows this, those results as well as you can see. This is the zero to five scale and they were all very high um, ratings. And I also asked for some qualitative responses of what they thought were the benefits or lack thereof of the program. And these were the um, main ones that I pulled out. And I tried to incorporate ones that weren't re rep repetitive, <laughs> as I'm repeating myself. Um, so I pulled out ones. I did get some repeated responses similar to these ideas that it was a great learning experience that they liked how in-depth the whole process was because it was very comprehensive going through each of the stages of diagnostic protocol. Um, they, I put in that the hypothesis section was not helpful because it didn't really matter towards their credit. So that also shows that there is some um, reason, that they had a basis for not liking it. It wasn't just that they don't think a hypothesis is necessary, it was just that they didn't fully uh, add to the percentage that they got on it so they could change it as much as they want so they didn't feel like it was as relevant. But we know that it is very relevant and we do still emphasize that a hypothesis is an important precursor to determining what assessment you want to do. Um, they liked being able to talk to collaborators so they liked to be able to figure out who they would work with 
um, or who they would want to get additional information from. They liked that it provided real-time feedback, so when they could make adjustments from, they got feedback from their computer program, but that it also allows for us to give feedback as well. Um, they thought it was low stress because it doesn't have the risk involved. You can make mistakes and go back and correct them. You can um, make adjustments without harming your client or having to, I've had situations with, the, with new students practicing with real clients and they make a mistake and we have to go and say, oh, can you come back or we have to go get that kid again because we scored the test wrong. You, that doesn't, that's not a concern with a, the SIMI case. Um, they liked that they had to come up with, they, liked, they felt they learned a lot from the case history and that's probably because it was in collaboration with instruction. So Dr. Shuey talked about it's not just the computer program, but she also learned where they needed help and increased instruction in that area. So it provides um, insight to us as well about where we should add some of our own instruction. They liked that it was interactive um, and that they had the variety of different cases. So it's not just one type of disorder, it's a variety of disorders across age ranges and disorder types. Um, that it was easy to navigate. It allowed for a feeling of a more hands-on learning experience rather than lecture. Um, and it allowed them to practice. So it's the kind of tool that if you want to go and just practice your skills, you can just go and practice the skills. You don't have to have someone available. You can go to your program and work on whatever you have identified as something that is a weakness or that you would like to improve. Um, and that, in turn, builds more confidence. And that's what one of the goals is, is to build your own self-critiquing uh, skills and self-analysis skills and your own confidence in your abilities. And that's what I think the program does a really good job of doing. So the benefits are um, repeated practice, can be used as a remedi remediation tool. So if we have some students who are having difficulty, we can uh, suggest that they do perform some extra practice and sh show that they can do the, they, they do have the competency with the skills, that we feel that there are concerns that they might be lacking. There's no risk. It has practical application um, of knowledge. It's not just saying, hey, we're going to teach you this knowledge, but we're going to ask you to use it. We want you to show us the skill. Um, it's experiential and reflective learning. So again, it requires you to have some self-analysis skills. It builds up your own awareness, which is a key skill for de growth and development, is to be a good analyzer of yourself. What I always say to students is that the data that I get for when I do therapy or my evidence that I get is not just to tell me how my client is doing, or how, but also to reflect whether I'm effective or not. So when, if their progress is not, if they're not making progress, then it's not just that they're not doing well, it's what can I do differently? What can I do? What adjustments can I make in my, the way I help my client? Um, it might not just be within the client that the problem is. So, it supports the evidence-based practice that takes away some of the subjectivity, um, and it makes it more comprehensive. So there's a lot of different, another one I really liked was that uh, it supplements populations that we might not typically see, but also it lets you consider some ethical dilemmas and some considerations that you might be out there that if you just look at it on paper, you can eliminate. When you have it in real life, you can think of some of the ethical considerations that you have to make when you're collaborating or the questions you might ask or how you can be culturally sensitive in the questions you ask as well. Um, so in conclusion, um, I actually pulled this from some of the research that's out there that evidence suggests that students who use simi case are motivated and encouraged um, during the and engaged in the experience because they have the real life scenarios, so it gives them a little bit of a more real life situation. It helps build their decision making skills, which I think is very important like a researcher. You have to be able to have that not accepting attitude, but this idea that I can be a problem solver and a decision maker, and I don't have to have someone else make that decision for me. I've had a lot of new therapists say to me, 
am I the one who makes the diagnosis? Am I supposed to make it? Yeah, you're making the diagnosis. You're making the decision what's going to happen. And that's a scary thing for a lot of new clinicians. Even when I have, I do all the externship training uh, meetings, and I just had the externs who are out really working in the real world now come back, and they said one of the hardest things that they have is that they ask the speech therapist their, if they can go home or not. They want their opinion. Are they safe to go home? They, are they cognitively safe to go home? Am I making that decision about their life? Yeah, they're making it, you're making that decision. It's a life-changing decision. So getting practice at being able to back yourself up and really have strong decision-making skills is really important in our field. Um, and then also offers the dynamic learning environment. And I, that's really important um, in every area of education, to have a teaching philosophy that really incorporates applying skills and using your skills um, and not just learning and then carrying out. It doesn't work as well, in my opinion, as when you can incorporate it all together. So hopefully programs like this, we're finding it effective and hopefully um, we're able to continue to figure it out and use it and help supplement some of our other education that we also know is great too. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, I think that was my last slide. Yeah. And I finished right on time and I talked as fast as you all know I, I do. <laughs> Everyone who knows me knows that that was probably normal rate, maybe a little bit uh, faster than normal. Any questions? Do you have any questions? Okay. type of environment um, and you're providing therapy from a distance. Um, it's used a lot out in the Midwest because clients are two, three, four hours from a hospital in order to get therapy. Um, and it's used in areas where there's just a severe lack of speech language pathologists. We have used it already in the grad program. We've tried it with a client. Yeah, clients that can't come in every day, they don't have the ability to drive, they don't have somebody to drive in. So sometimes we offer them services through Telepractice. Everything has to be really secure, and you have to have a lot of special types of things in place to make sure that no one can hack into or get access to the therapy session. Those types. We do utilize those. But that, and that's mainly used, though, I think, for the treatment at the treatment level. So it's this, right. I don't know if you would do diagnostics that way, but it definitely gives you that idea of getting used to that kind of dynamic of working through, not with a real person, but even though the real person's through there, it's still a little bit of a different dynamic. You don't pick up on all the same kind of interaction. Jim, so. oh, Dr. Ackerman said there was 25 different cases. Does that mean there's 25 different diagnoses also? Or are some like repeated? Some repeated. I think some might be repeated, but there's a pretty good variety in there. Most of them are assessments, like the one I showed, but there are four or five actually intervention ones. They have different components to them. <coughs> And, and they're they're going to be adding more and more, so but, you know I think there's a pretty good diversity. Well, there's, there are several um, different types of aphasia. There are different types of um, swallowing clients. Clients that are having difficulty swallowing um, due to different etiologies and things like Less. that within the program as well. Um, they're supposed to be adding another five cases during the summer. Um, what they're asking is that people like us. Uh, provide a case to them, um, and then that case, when you present a case to them, it goes through a reviewer team where five different people have to look at the case, make sure that all the professionals agree with the same diagnosis, the same assessment choices, um, the best questions, and those types of things. So it goes through quite a vetting process before a case gets up. Um, so uh, I keep getting updates. They send me updates as to when a new case has been added. Um, but even if it's the same diagnosis, say it's a language disorder diagnosis, it might be for preschool versus school age versus adult. So um, you're looking at different things based on the age of the child or, the, um, or whether it's an adult versus a child.
And our students mm -hmm. took to it very easily, yes, I think, because of gameplay. Like, a lot of people have played interactive games on the computers. Um, so they, they took to it very quickly and were very comfortable with it. And they didn't even mind spending. Um, the first one for me uh, was a client with aphasia for the students. And the first time they did it, it took them two to four hours to do it. By the time they went to the second client, they had honed their skills, especially in the, in the area of uh, interviewing the client and interviewing collaborators. So they, they pretty much finished it in about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. So their skills got much more efficient. They got faster. Um, they were able to see how all the pieces of an evaluation, all the parts of things, all the information that you gather becomes, um, it's kind of like a mystery that you have to solve. So you take all the pieces of the mystery and the puzzle and you put it together and you come up with an appropriate diagnosis and treatment plan. And um, I think when they learn it, they tend to learn things in isolation. This allows us to, where they synthesize all the knowledge that they have. They get a lot of knowledge, but we need them to synthesize it and make it functional for them um, and for them to be able to use it accurately. Any additional questions? If you need things signed, please <laughs> come with a pen. One of us, or Dr. Bajor, can sign it. Before you go, let's give our panel an extra.